that jig gets down there and those fish just come flying up to it. <laughs> you know, and this, these are the type of fish that we're catching. Um, we've got weather change came in and this uh, wind started blowing, but fish don't seem to mind. Here, I got one here too, Tony. Perfect. Heavy fish. Yeah, the fish, we're in western Minnesota again with our good friend Tony Mariotti. And we have filmed a lot of shows with Tony over in the past. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a nice, nice skill. But what we're doing is running basins, typical pattern come midwinter. And we are fishing with a tungsten jig called the Northland Tackle Banana Bug that I've just fallen in love with. There's a lot of times in this deep water, just a matter of getting back down to the fish, it's just a race because we've drilled holes and haven't found anything, haven't marked anything, and now drill the hole and there's just a column of fish, 10 feet of fish, and that's typical of these deep basins. You can be 10 feet away and not mark nothing, not catch nothing, slide over and there's 10 feet of fish. These fish just seem to move through the water column like a, almost like a vertical Christmas tree and it's easy to be off the mark. On many bodies of water, panfish will migrate out over deeper basins at first ice. Basins or holes will often hold fish through the winter and will load up with more fish as the winter progresses and shallow weeds die off. Basins that have a soft bottom and range between 15 to 40 feet in depth are often best. Panfish will hold tight to the bottom over these basins or suspend through the water column. As a general rule of thumb, lakes with poor water clarity, where there is little weed growth, typically see basin patterns that happen much tighter to the bottom. On lakes with good water clarity and good weed growth, fish suspend through the water column much more. When panfish are roaming basins, they can be anywhere, but top locations to target include transitions or edges where the basin intersects a deep weed edge. Panfish will often suspend off of sharp contour breaks, inside turns like the deeper mouth of a shallow bay, and off under water points. Basins can often be large and intimidating, but by focusing on high percentage locations, pinpointing the schools of these fish gets to be a much easier task. There you go. Nice, Tony. He's a little small, but it shows that uh, by getting those heavy jigs down there that quickly, how uh, that can be your reward. I'm gonna try to get this jig down there again. You know, another thing we found when we're in these basins, we're, we're finding all kinds of fish. Um, you know, bass will swim these basins, pike, tool will be, panfish, crappies, your sunfish. And they're all moving through these basins. And it's been interesting because throughout the day we've caught a bunch of different kinds of fish. And it's, it's something that you can use your electronics, you can use your Vexlar to differentiate between the different species coming in. Um, you know, when, when the tulabi or whitefish are moving in, there's a lot more darting. I mean, there's a fish, it's gone. There's a fish, it's gone. And a lot of times as you move your jig and kind of work down, they'll chase it down. They'll chase it back up. They'll chase it down and then they're gone. Then they're here. A pike will come in and all of a sudden all, a bunch of your marks will disappear and a big, big, thick red mark will show up and we'll know that a pike or sometimes a bass has moved in. Our panfish you know, are typically your, your individual marks or if a large mark comes and you kind of start jigging up, you can get them to separate into smaller marks until they get right to you. But just kind of using your electronics out in these basins, you'll, you, you do learn. You learn to tell what kind of fish you know, what kind of mood they're in. It's, it's, been, it's been fun to do. We'll be right back with more Panfish on yeah, Ice. Look at that. Whoa! <laughs> you know, in ice fishing circles, especially amongst pan fishermen, probably one of the biggest trends last, oh, 
five years or so have been the use of tungsten. Now tungsten isn't for everything, every day, but you get over these big deep basins where a lot of panfish spend a lot of the winter, you can get down to that deeper water fast. We're just fishing over a basin that's about 21 feet of water. And it's just a matter of looking, looking, looking. You finally find the fish. You have five feet of fish below you. It's a matter of getting that fish up and getting it back down fast for those fish drift off. And that's probably the real edge of tungsten is that it gets down fast after you catch a fish. Sometimes using tungsten in this deeper water, it can be a difference between catching 10 fish and catching three fish when a school comes through. There they come. Another nice fish. Just as fast as you can get it down there. There's a crappie. Oh yeah, look at that, Tony. You know, and he just absolutely inhaled that bait. I still have fish down there, Jason. There we go. That fish is digging. Andy Bluegill. Look at that. Whoa! <laughs> you know, and I think it's an advantage, but something that often doesn't get said when you're using this heavy tungsten. That tungsten's probably about, oh, twice as heavy as lead. But one of the things that enables you to do at times which can be an advantage is that you can use four pound test in a lot of cases. And you know, if you're on a tough bite, I mean, I've seen it where you have to use one pound test, you have to use two pound test. But I tell you what, over the course of the day, if you're on a somewhat decent bite, you can get away with four pound test. I think over the course of the day, you just get more efficient to where you can lift the fish to your hand. You know, so sometimes with fishing, it's just a matter of less going wrong. It's probably, I don't know, five degrees out here. We've got a good wind going and it can be real easy to break stuff. This is kind of my search mode here. Put the Vexilar mounted right on the dash here, but just making big moves and trying to find fish. You know, these basins, you know, really the fish can be anywhere. Tony, he's focusing on a lot of edges, whether it's a point coming off, a sunken island, a lot of times if there's any type of structure, what we've been noticing is these fish have been suspended over the basin, but they're off, off the structure. They're relating to the structure, but they're over the basin. So with that being said, you know, we're making big moves trying to just find some areas where the water columns lighten up. And we're starting to mark some fish here now. So basically we'll start making the small moves at this point and just try to fine tune it a little bit here and see if we can get oh, these fish going. That was a crappie. I've got six feet of fish, seven feet off the bottom and higher. There we go. He was only about six feet down. You know, nice crappie. You know, which is really something that can be said. Underneath us, we've got six, seven feet of fish, and they're anywhere from four feet off the bottom to, you know, about 15 feet down. And what we're doing. So we're trying to find the ceiling that these fish will move up to. And if you move your jig up and move it up, move it up, and try to get to the point where the fish will not come any higher. And usually that's where they're gonna be their most aggressive. That's where they're gonna grab that bait and pull it back down, get him back. But uh, every day that ceiling might change a little bit as far as uh, height. It might be, you know, maybe you can get them up to 15 feet one day, maybe the next day 13 feet. But if you can find that ceiling that they'll come up to, that's where you want to at least try to try to spend your time fishing. You don't want to try to fish above it. You want to try to get them to that level. I'm going to get back down there. I got them down there. Holy cow. There we go. It's dandy bluegill. Up and down, Tony. There you go. How high off the bottom are you, Tony? Uh, they're coming up, they're shooting up about eight feet down. Eight feet? Um, you know, all that we're doing today is we're using soft plastics and heavy tungsten jigs. Um, here I'm using the Northlands 
little uh, banana bug and this low profile heavy jig is working its way down quickly gets right to the fish and as you can see it's uh, fish on we'll be right back that is a handful right there is that a beautiful sight Another nice skill. Oh, Tony, that's a dandy. Just another dandy. Basin roaming fish, and he absolutely inhaled that little banana bug. You know, again, when you're using these heavy jigs and sending them through the water column fast, these fish are coming up and just smoking them. You still got a bunch of them down there, Tony? No, they just took off. I've lost them too. They're fleeting, aren't they? Very fleeting. They they come in, you get you know a minute or two or three, and then they're gone. Yeah. You can either hop around or kind of wait for them to come back. Yeah, that's the thing is there's you either have nothing or you have five, six, seven feet of them. Yep. You know these fish you see on this Vexlar FL28. These fish have been coming anywhere from all oh, three, four feet off the bottom all the way up to halfway in the water column they've been just coming through everywhere and so what i've been doing is i've been just kind of working it up working it down i'm working this jig pretty aggressively you can see i've got a impulsed soft plastic tail there that really puts off a lot of vibration and i'm just trying to call these fish in but it's just a matter of these fish are just wandering wandering around they're, they're these suspended fish are always moving and it's just a matter of just trying to work up and down through the water column Trying to bring them in. Trying to mark them, trying to get them over to me. You know, one of the things that I get asked an awful lot about is how to narrow down a lake. Where do you pick a place to fish? And all that we did today, and some fish are showing up, is we took a look at a lake map. Um, we found a deep water basin off some shallow weeds. And we just decided to go out and pop some holes in that basin. And we made a series of, I don't know, 15, 20 holes and just, uh, started moving around them and when the fish are there and when they show up boy you know they're they're thick um, we found that you can sit on a hole and they're going to keep getting refreshed over time and as the winds picked up we haven't been moving around as much but you definitely can stay on these fish by popping more holes in the basin and moving around um, not always needed but definitely uh, will keep you warmer and uh, you can stay with the fish see where they're moving and uh, kind of see the pattern that they're following Oh, the fish on. <laughs> I did not know that fish was there. And again, inhaled this jig. You know, with these soft plastics, it doesn't take much to trigger the fish. They're very soft and they've got a lot of movement. So a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm just letting my just letting my my body just quiver that rod tip. I'm just using a meat stick that's got a very soft tip. That fiberglass tip is just sanded down so you can just get that nice, nice tight quiver. You know, all you want is that tail to dance. And the tighter you can make that quiver, the less it spins. And that's the whole key, fishing these soft plastics. You can rip them and really get aggressive to call fish in. And then once they come in, you get them to elevate, come up, come up, come up. And then you just do that quiver. And usually that seals the deal. From our base camp in Devil's Lake, North Dakota, we travel the whole Midwest looking for the best fishing bites. If you like real-time fish reports, find out what bodies of water that we're fishing just to find the general patterns and techniques that we're using, give us a like on Facebook and hit the road with Jason Mitchell Outdoors. Yeah, 22 feet of water and I have nine feet of fish underneath me. I got a big fish here, Tony. Nice. There. 
there's a dandy. There's a nice bluegill. Yeah. Show you here how I'm bringing up this plastic tail. These banana bugs have kind of an oblong shape. Kind of see it's got a, got a long, long shape and it really, really bounces and quivers. And that there's just an impulse soft plastic tail and I actually I trimmed it down because these fish have been just a little bit off today and how I'm tying it on there is just a loop knot it seems like with tungsten that loop knot will give that nice quiver when you when you when you quiver that tail in the water it'll just dance and it'll just it'll just come alive but the whole key with tungsten is Make sure that the eyelet in the plastic is perfectly symmetrical. When you're quivering it, you want it to quiver where it's just perfectly symmetrical. If it goes off to one side, it doesn't seem to catch as many fish. It's almost like a crankbait being tuned. That's why so many tungsten jigs, if the, if the hooks aren't welded into that tungsten the right way, they just don't catch the same amount of fish. The weight of tungsten enhances the quivering action of soft plastics. The advantage of soft plastics are that they are durable, allowing you to catch several fish without having to rebait. You can experiment with colors throughout the day without having to retie. The action and profile can also be seen and felt from greater distances, which can be especially important when fishing out over basins. The fish have an easier time finding you. Well, here comes one up high, up high. Crappie has to be. That fish shot up. Oh, yeah. Another crappie. I just switched to a little one inch impulse tadpole, I think is what it is. And it's got a heck of a tail on it that uh, really seemed to throw off vibration, get these fish uh, coming up. I just put it on and it was a littler one, but uh, he came racing up and bit just like a typical crappie, straight up. And again, I have fish down there. It's where we've seen that the, the heavier tungsten jigs have really, really shined today because we can get right back down to those fish. And here they come already. I'm lifting them up just to see how high I can get them to come before either he tracks uh, another fish to bite or he'll bite. Heavy fish here, Tony. Nice, yeah, I got a double then. Yeah, that's a dandy here. Look at this. Look at this gill. Wow, wow, look at that. Get a hold of them there. Wow, that's a, that is a handful right there. Isn't that a beautiful sight? Come through your whole hand. Yeah, just that small plastic tail. These fish, I think, can see and feel these tails from a long ways and you're looking out over these basins, but that's the strategy right there. That's a, just a gorgeous fish. I'll put this fish back. But I tell you what, wherever panfish swim, the midwinter, this is just such a common pattern. A lot of these locations, aren't a secret by any means, but even in these locations that are pretty predominant across the ice belt, you can still catch a few more fish by just getting a little bit more efficient out on the ice. And that's what tungsten can do. Jason Mitchell Outdoors is brought to you by Shields, North Dakota Tourism, Clam, Vexilar, Jason Mitchell Elite Series Rods, Ice Armor, Northland Tackle, Cooper Chevrolet, Bionic Line, and Salmo. To find out more information on Jason Mitchell Outdoors, make their official webpage one of your favorite pages. Find out upcoming show schedules and airtimes, along with past shows, 
article and product reviews at jasonmitchelloutdoors.com. Great information on the outdoors is just one click away.